today I stand before you, not just as a surgeon with four decades of experience in the operating theater, but as someone who has witnessed firsthand the delicate process of planning and coordination that keeps our patients alive and well. I have also seen the deadly consequences in failed planning and coordination, especially in a hospital setup. And I will tell you how serious it can become and how we can overcome those situations. For years, I have been privileged to heal the sick, mend the injured, and alleviate suffering through surgery. However, the success of these efforts has always hinged on a well-functioning supply chain, one that ensures the seamless availability of medical and paramedical staff, as well as essential supplies such as various types of medicine, oxygen, electricity, various equipments that are needed for surgery and for diagnostic purposes. Any disruption in this chain can have profound consequences, especially for those patients teetering on the edge between life and death. Our discussion on supply chain management today is not just about logistics. It's about saving lives, even in the face of adversity. My lecture today to this elite group of business professionals, the future business leaders of this island nation and overseas is titled, Rising above, embracing adversity to seize new opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, as we journey through the adventure called life, each of us choose a path, a profession that shapes our destiny. Like a roller coaster ride, each career has highs and lows, unexpected twists, and moments that challenge us in ways we never imagined. These experiences, thrilling, daunting, and sometimes adverse, are what truly shape who we are and who we become. Let me give you two examples. For the first one, let me choose a company setting. I am sure many of you have faced a situation. For many years and or months, you have planned and executed a major pro project and introduced a product only to see your client unexpectedly pulling out, bringing a project to a halt. This not only threatens team morale, but also the company's financial stability. Instead of retreating, you see an opportunity. You rally the team, pivot the project, repurpose the work for a different market. In the end, you secure a new client with even greater potential and develop a product that opens doors to new opportunities. What started as a setback turns into a game-changing moment because you have embraced adversity and innovated. Now let's think about the second scenario in a more personal setting. Imagine being diagnosed with a chronic illness that upends your life. At first, it feels like a curse disrupting your routines and mental well-being. But instead of giving in to the despair, you choose to embrace the challenge. You research, seek expert advice, and adapt a healthier lifestyle. This adversity then becomes the catalyst for a new passion for wellness, allowing you to manage your condition and inspire others facing similar challenges. Adversity, often viewed as a roadblock, is actually a catalyst for growth. Challenges, whether a failed project, missed opportunity, or unexpected obstacle, present us with a choice to let them defeat us or refine us. Setbacks push us to dig deeper, tap into inner strength, and discover new solutions. It is in these 
struggles that we build resilience, creativity, and a fresh perspective. Embracing adversity strengthens us, making us more capable and better prepared for future challenges. The key is not to fear adversity, but to see it as a vital step towards success. Today, I invite you to embark on a transformative journey with me, one shaped by my experiences as a doctor and surgeon. Over more than four decades in this field, I have faced many challenges, but three pivotal moments stand out, moments that not only catalyze my professional and personal growth, but also carry valuable lessons you can apply in your own careers. First, my appointment to a resource-limited rural hospital where the supply chain and operational management were in complete disarray, where I was expected to provide adequate care to patients. I had no knowledge, unlike all of you here, who learn operation supply chain management. Second, the unexpected and overwhelming influx of battle-wounded patients at my hospitals which tested our resilience and creativity in every way. Finally, the most daunting of all, flying to the war front in transport planes that had no seats, performing surgeries under extreme conditions to save lives and limbs. Each of these experiences not only shaped my career, but also deepened my commitment to serving the community in the face of adversity. Let's journey back to the 1980s to a rural district in Sri Lanka. In this region, home to around 260,000 people, there was a single hospital with just 200 beds. Every day, 200 to 300 patients sought medical care for various illnesses. Although most of them sought treatment for common ailments, which each one of us have on and off, Others had issues which required to be attended by a surgeon, a physician, obstetrician, or a gynecologist. But here was the challenge. The hospital resources were extremely limited. As far as my specialty of surgery is concerned, there was only one surgeon at this hospital and for the entire district of 260,000 people. You could say we were short-staffed of experts. There were no management consultants. Is there any health care professional here who can give me a solution to this problem? I will meet you later. I also forgot to mention something, that there was no anesthetist as well. Tell me how a surgeon can operate on so many patients without an anesthetist. Any solution? <laughs> There was a complete disruption in planning and supply chain as regards staff, medicines, equipments, and so on. Imagine the pressure and the responsibility that came if you were that surgeon. It was a one-man show. Think of a company today. You have the CEO and the people who do the work, but in that setup, that surgeon had to do all the work in his ward in addition to performing surgery on 15 to 20 patients per day. Did you know that today there exists a surgical robotic system called the Da Vinci Surgical System, with each unit costing around 2 million US dollars? There are more than 5,500 of these advanced robots operating worldwide. Despite their sophistication, even the simplest procedures with this system can take two to three hours. Even the most advanced robotic system available today would struggle to meet the daily surgical demands of that rural hospital. After, my, after completing my surgical training in the United Kingdom, I returned to Sri Lanka with a sense of purpose eager to contribute to the healthcare system. I was appointed as the surgeon for this hospital, 
which pushed me beyond my professional comfort zone for the first time. My initial optimism quickly collided with the harsh reality on the ground. The hospital served the poorest and the most vulnerable in our community. People who had nowhere else to turn in times of illness. The facilities were woefully inadequate, falling far short of the level of care these patients deserved. In case of acute illness, some patients had to be transferred to better equipped hospitals, a delay that sometimes cost them their lives. Despite numerous complaints to the authorities, the response was frustratingly so slow. Think of those times where your computer wasn't working or the printer was without any ink. How do you feel? Angry, frustrated. Yes, that is the human reaction. In a situation like this, what would you do? Where the planning and the supply chain has changed completely. You have two choices, either retreat from the challenge or rise to the occasion and become the catalyst for growth and change. I was dealing with the life of my patients and for me, the only choice was to take decisive action to enhance the facilities and elevate the services offered to the community. However, such a monumental task could not be accomplished single-handedly. We appeal for help to uplift this hospital as it required the collective support and funding from capable individuals. Cooperation of the local community, the clergy, private institutions, the army and the police, all of them made valuable contributions. Additionally, international organizations, as you see here, aid from Canada with development projects in that area stepped in, providing essential funds and equipment through their respective embassies in Sri Lanka. And we also had aid from JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency, which came forward on our request to upgrade the hospital. Here we see a basic operating theater. We cannot operate any, we have to operate in an operating theater where there are facilities. Otherwise, we are putting the patients at risk. Here we have the operating table. We need a good light, the anesthetic machine, a sucker machine, diathermy. There must be adequate space, the air condition, and the staff, and enough workspace. And it must be in a very good environment. Today, the operating theaters are much more sophisticated with a lot of equipment. So that is an advancement that takes place every day. <clears throat> we needed an anesthetist as well at the hospital as I could not perform surgeries without an anesthetist. Despite our repeated requests, the Department of Fail Health failed to appoint a Sri Lankan anesthetist as no one was willing to serve in our rural hospital. Eventually, they appealed to the WHO and we were fortunate to receive an anesthetist from Burma. He adapted very well to the circumstances and met our needs in every way, enabling me to carry out surgeries effectively. That is my anesthetist from Burma. And you can see something around the neck. That is a snake. And he used to kill these snakes and make reptile soup, which was also needed for us. Another part of supply chain to keep the nutrition going for the patients, surgeon and the anesthetist. So that is what happened and we got anesthetist. With good planning, support of the community, teamwork and activation of the supply chain, including the reptile soup. The transformation that took place in that rural hospital was nothing short of astounding. What was once a dilapidated building was reborn as a bustling center for a array, wide array of surgeries, addressing diseases that span the entire human body. This was the essence of true general surgery experience. 
where every day we face unfamiliar challenges to innovation, adaptation, and sheer determination. I navigated these obstacles, turning them into opportunities for growth. This hands-on learning journey not only boosted my confidence, but also let me meticulously document the process. I captured photographs and shared my experiences at academic meetings in Colombo, leaving many astonished. The recognition that followed extended not just to me, but also to the staff and the hospital, which became known for its excellence. Today in the field of management, it is called operational excellence. What began as adversity had blossomed into remarkable opportunity for growth and development, driven by teamwork and an unwavering commitment to our community, the basics of which I'm sure you have learned in your MBA course. However, as life often does, it threw an unexpected challenge on, on our way. When, we, when war erupted in the neighboring district, everyone will face challenges in the business community. You will feel chal face challenges in your jobs. And you have to find methods of overcoming these challenges and progressing. What I faced was a war situation. War is universally known as a devastating and chaotic force, presenting complex challenges and demanding tough decisions. It requires the unyielding dedication of healthcare professionals, even those without training in combat-related injuries. I found myself in just such a situation, with no prior knowledge or training in managing war injuries something neither medical school nor surgical training had prepared me for. But my patients needed care. I could not let the adversity of the situation hinder my ability to save lives and limbs. So what does one do when confronted with the, with the unknown? You learn because learning is an ongoing journey, especially when lives depend on it. For me, the only way to learn was by reading about the subject from books. However, there were no medical libraries in our district, no smartphones at that time, no internet, and Google hadn't even been invented yet. My only option was to travel 200 kilometers to the medical library in Colombo, where I would spend hours reading about war surgery in textbooks and surgical journals. I photocopied these articles, returned to my station, and put the principles I had studied into practice with each battle casualty. I encountered, I learned on the job, educated my team, and worked collaboratively to save lives and limbs. Recognizing the medical, meticulous care provided to the battle wounded at this hospital, the defense authorities decided to offer further support. They constructed a special military ward for those injured in battle with the Minister of Health, the Chief of Defense Staff, and the Army Command at that time attending the opening ceremony of the ward to acknowledge our services. This once dormant and dilapidated hospital was transformed into a hive of activity becoming a vital center for treating the war wounded. Adversity transformed into an opportunity for growth and development, driven by teamwork and an unwavering commitment to the community. This dedication both from and to the community empowered the staff in the hospital to carry on the work even after my departure, six years and four months after I started work at this hospital. Remarkably, when I initially visited the hospital, I didn't expect to stay even a month. But circumstances change, and they change for the better. As the war intensified, the demand for surgeons on the front lines grew urgent. 
the situation was critical and refusal was simply not an option. I went the extra mile by flying directly to the war zone with the troops, adapting to cramped spaces and limited resources and relying on creativity and resourcefulness to deliver emergency surgical care. Picture this, I found myself on planes that were never meant to carry medical teams. These aircrafts were designed solely for transporting soldiers, equipment, and even weapons to the front. Seats were scarce, so what do you do in such a situation? You sit on the floor, stand during the flight, like traveling in a CTB bus, or perch on whatever object is available. I'll never forget the time I sat on what I thought was just another barrel, only to later realize it was a bomb. That was adaptation to the circumstances. That truly means. We operated as a unified team, performing surgery, emergency surgeries under challenging conditions using whatever resources we had at our disposal. Without the support of specialized trauma teams, initially a small group comprising of a single surgeon, a junior doctor, a junior anesthetist, and army paramedics was tasked with saving lives. When you start something, you start small, and as you proceed, you identify problems, and you st start developing, you rectify these problems stage by stage, and that is another aspect of planning. With time, the situation improved, and that is because we started in a small way. We identified the problems. Later on, specialized teams were made available to treat injuries of different regions of the body. That was development as we went on to improve the service and care of those injured in battle. One of our most critical operations was performing limb amputations, a procedure that requires cutting through the bone with a saw. However, we faced a significant uh, hurdle. We had only one or two handheld saws, which had been blunt after considerable use. We had no electric saws at that time, and we had to find an alternative solution. To meet that challenge, I took the initiative to procure a new hacksaw and hacksaw blade from the local hardware stores at my expense. There was no other choice. The government could not supply us with electric saws. There was no money. These sharper and more effective blades made our work not only possible, but more efficient in those dire circumstances. That was another issue concerning the supply chain. If there is a deficiency, you must find a way of overcoming it. Whether it's a surgical saw or a hacksaw, it's the same. We'll do the cutting the same way. And it was easier to cut with this rather than the surgical saw. Transporting casualties back to Colombo presented us with another challenge. Due to the absence of dedicated medical evacuation planes, we had to get creative. Even in your field of business, you have to be creative. We removed the seats to make room for patients on stretchers. And in the, in the process, found ourselves sitting on the floor alongside them. It was far from ideal, but it was the only option available adding yet another unique experience to our journey. And that is how you face and adapt to challenges. Adversity, as I come to know, is a profound teacher, if we are willing to learn. The key lies in our resilience and openness to growth, even in the face of toughest challenges. Throughout my career, I have found that embracing these challenges with a positive mindset has been crucial in 
turning obstacles into opportunities for advancement. I also decided to document my journey, not just for posterity, but to offer valuable insights for those who follow in my footsteps and to anyone seeking knowledge from my experiences. All those engineers here know Newton's third law, which states every action has an equal and opposite reaction. This is the same with adversity. Adversity isn't just something to endure. It's a gift, a challenge to discover our strength and potential. Every obstacle is an opportunity to rise, rewrite our story, and transform our lives. Embracing adversity leads not just to survival, but to thriving innovation and a future full of possibilities. So to do all those in this auditorium today, I urge you to embrace the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead, to push the boundaries of what is possible and lead with passion, purpose and integrity. The future is in your hands and it is up to you to shape a world that is brighter, more innovative and more sustainable for all. Thank you very much for listening to me so patiently. <laughs> <laughs>